everybody, happy Monday. Welcome into Concrete Jungle, a New York baseball podcast here on FairLakes1.com. Coming you guys live from the FL1 studios, North Park building in Santa Falls, New York. Paul Russo, alongside me as always, Kyle Evans, behind the scenes, Nate Sharman. Boys, how are we doing? Happy Monday. Happy Monday, doing pretty good. How are you? Good, good. A uh, lot to um, discuss, you know, some points now, some points later. Um, Mets, unfortunately, met their uh, demise officially last night on the season. Obviously, that will be our first talking point. Yankees know who they're playing uh, with the Cleveland Guardians, so obviously jump into that as well. And then um, because, you know, we're going to, you know, have a little bit less overall to talk about, we'll take a look at um, really all the MLB postseason picture at this point. It's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, the AL at the very least, went the way I predicted anyway. Uh, the NL, quite the opposite. So uh, we'll jump and take a look at uh, the series ahead at this point and kind of what we can, in theory, I'd say, expect to see through the first couple of days of postseason play uh, starting tomorrow. So looking forward to it. Um, let's jump in. Obviously, the Mets uh, losing the NL wild card round, uh, the series that they had 2-1 to one to the Padres. Uh, well, obviously, we'll, we'll do all the games first, then we'll jump right in. So, uh, Friday night, game one, a 7-1 to one Padre victory over the Mets. Hugh Darvish uh, picks up the win, his postseason record, 1-0. 1-2-9 uh, ERAs will Hill carry, and then Max Scherzer picking up the loss, 0-1, oh, a 13.5 uh, ERA. That will be his final postseason tally. Uh, your top performers, Eduardo Escobar, 2-3, for three, a home run, a double, a walk, RBI on run scored, pretty much provided all the run supporting offense for the Mets. Uh, Brendan Nimmo went one for four with a triple, and Starling Marte two for four. Saturday was a seven to three Met victory. Jacob Degrom picks up the win. Postseason uh, numbers for him will be one to zero with a three flat ERA. Nick Martinez took the loss out of the Padre bullpen. His uh, postseason stats as of right now: zero for one, three three eight ERA. And Seth Lugo picked up the save. Uh, it will be the lone postseason save for the Mets. Kind of weird when you think about it out loud like that. And then Sunday last night, obviously a six nothing Padre victory. Joe Musgrove picked up the win, one and zero o o ERA. Chris Bass at the loss, zero and one, a six seven five ERA. Pete Alonso went one for three, collected the only hit on the night. Starling Marte went zero for three with a walk, the only other Met base runner on base. And then Chris Bassett, four innings, three hits, three earned, three walks, two strikeouts. Uh, maybe not on surface what appears to be a good stat line, but. Uh, I certainly thought um, he deserved the fifth inning or at least attempted to get out there for the fifth inning and give it to him. I don't know where I really want to start with this Met team. Uh, this was a team that uh, we did have some, we'll call it higher expectations for as the season continuously went on. Uh, certainly this is their early window opportunity here. Uh, they they should be back beyond what the wild card around. I'd say barring some sort of catast catastrophe injury-wise or anything like that. So let's start here, I guess. The offense, especially highlighted last night, one hit, overall struggles, really the final collective 10 days of the year. Um, and it's tough because, you know, in this part, it's a different discussion for a podcast in the future is uh, I don't know what other improvements you can kind of do to that offense in the offseason. Uh, especially you look at what they did overall this year. Yeah, I, my takeaway from the game is, yeah, the pitching struggled a little bit, um, especially Scherzer, obviously, in game one. That's not what you want. But my biggest takeaway is four runs and in 27 innings yeah. against that Padres pitching staff and that Padres bullpen, who, if in my opinion, the Padres bullpen isn't among the best that are in the postseason right For now. Sure. So, um the offense just wasn't really there. I know you can blame the, the starting pitching, but, mm -hmm. you know, the first game, one run. You can't win games with one run, especially right. postseason games. The, the final game, you know, one hit, no runs. I mean, how can you win those games? Mm. So, really, if you look at the numbers, it's not surprising that the Padres won the series. Yeah. The Mets didn't show up. I should have worded this portion of it a little bit better. I, I know on the bottom third, I, I put it as Marte plays hero, but uh, we usually kind of call that for a person who – um, kind of does, you know, the quote-unquote heroics or what they think to be heroics and aren't needed. But um, you want to talk about a, a, a warrior in a way. I mean, Marte's playing with some broken fingers and some issues with his hand. Um, 
And look, I mean, he obviously, no, this is not him, but he did a really good job, all things considered. Uh, I know he garnered a lot of respect from not only his teammates, but the Padres had a lot of respect for him for for getting out there in this series and, and trying to make an impact, and he did. All things considered, Friday, he, he tried uh, to get that offense going. I mean, obviously, Escobar, right? Um, a guy we've talked about a ton as well. He he got the RBI that that run making offense right. Nimmo got on base, couldn't they couldn't get him in, but you know Marte got on base multiple times throughout this series. Uh, base hits, yeah, just he he went out there and gave I think above and beyond a hundred percent. Yeah, I think Charlie Marte put together definitely some quality at bats Friday and Saturday night. Um, last night struggled a little bit, but for the most part, he's one of the few players that showed up. Yeah. Um, I know he couldn't throw the ball well. We've seen a play in right field where mm -hmm. he threw the ball back into the infield and it just sailed uh, to the right. But um, he tried, and I mean that's that's all you can ask for. Yeah. Um, and and speaking of health here, um, you know Max Scherzer Friday with his start certainly didn't look. Um, Right, and he hasn't looked right the past few starts. Obviously, he dealt with that. Um, he had the oblique issue, um, and it almost looks like he was still trying to compensate a little bit for it, especially Friday night. Uh, the starts for him, really, like I said, the past few have just been pretty uncharacteristic to that end. Um, you know, a point off air that you made, Kyle, that I, I kind of we I think we do kind of forget about. Right, he's he is thirty eight. Uh, these injuries at this point, especially the core ones where you know obliques and stuff like that, kind of. Kind of go. I mean, they they are tougher to rebound from the older you get. Um, obviously, one year left on the deal um, for him, but I, I don't think there's going to be too much worry going into the next year. Obviously, with the off season now officially here for the Mets, um, you know, what are your thoughts? I guess in this sense, I I don't think they they played it wrong. Uh, I think maybe I would have maybe done Degrom game one. I mean, just based off the way he performed Saturday, but hindsight's twenty twenty in that sense. Yeah, I didn't mind the move, especially because of the experience Scherzer has in the postseason. He's usually pretty pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. um, and then I like the idea that if they would have won game one, they necessarily weren't going to start to Grom game two. I kind of like that idea. I liked how it was set up. They just, the offense didn't perform in game one. And, I mean, then you're kind of behind a little bit. I mean, you do grab the win Saturday night, but then you got Bassett. In a you know a winner take all game, it's just it, it didn't it didn't end up lining up the way that it should have. Yeah. A um, couple other things that I guess we can kind of really discuss now at this point with uh, with the Mets. Uh, obviously, I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. To me, it's a it's a bit of a moot point, but we do have to kind of discuss it to a degree. Obviously, uh, we get to a point later on in the game, uh, kind of the Mets are just spinning tires at this point. Uh, I'm still 4-0. I mean, anything can kind of happen, but uh, Buck Showalter um, wants to see Joe Musgrove's uh, ears checked. They were shiny. Twitter pointed it out, but um, at least to me, uh, they they, they kind of had the same glisten and and I guess brightness or whatever you want to kind of call it as really the rest of his face at that point. Uh, so uh, it's interesting. I, I think we'll I'll I'll kind of start there. We can kind of move on. Um, obviously. You no, know, we've, we've we've brought up a numerous times on here, Kyle. You're a pitcher. Um, that's your background uh, expertise, if you will. So, um, you know, I guess really the the thought process for me with asking you is, you know, if you're Musgrove, what's your thoughts in that situation in a way, and maybe if you're Buck, you know, what are the things you're kind of looking for uh, when when you do want to have a check on a pitcher like that? Well, it definitely was strange. Um, if I was Musgrove, if and I knew that I didn't have anything. I would have been very pissed off, and I probably would have reacted like him, you know, celebrating a little extra when you get those outs. Um, I mean, see, I mean, as it's pictured up there, I mean, it, there definitely is something on there, but is he actually using it? That's That was the question. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw, like, Andrew McCutcheon tweeting out that pitchers put some kind of stuff on their ears to, I don't know, do something with their body. I don't know, just all different, you know, speculation on mm -hmm. what it could be. Um, but... He seemed pretty confident when he was talking with the media and everything that it wasn't anything. Um, and I think it was embarrassing for Buck Showalter to go out there that late in the game to, you know, question that when he probably have seen it all the way, you know, to the first five five innings. Yeah. 
So I think that was definitely embarrassing on their part. Yeah, the timing of it was was rough to say the, the least. I know for me, I'm a big Buck guy. I mean, he's you know I figured the Yankees would take a run at him five six years ago uh, for the managerial position. They they really didn't. And uh, Buck's a really great MLB guy, great baseball guy, great baseball Q guy, but. Um, it, it's interesting if it wasn't for a playoff game, and this was some you know mundane game in June or July. I, uh, as much as I don't play by the quote unquote unwritten rules, I, I we probably would have seen some sort of brawl occur after the next pitch. Yeah, and, that, mean, and that's the thing with that is that it's an interesting move by Buck that now moving forward. I feel like you put your guys in a really tough spot, at least for sure early on next year anyway. Yeah, I mean, I figured the Padres wouldn't throw at them because of the situation of the game, but I did see, yeah, that's the tweet that I'm actually yeah. talking about. Um, I did see uh, a pitch, though, later in the game to Manny Machado. Um, Manny was kind of laughing at, you know, when they came out to check on him and everything, yeah. and he was kind of, like, saying stuff over to their dugout, looked like. Um, and then I saw them go up and in on Machado, the Mets. I think it was, like, 6-0 mm -hmm. f at that time. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was something to kind of watch. Yeah. But, but, but I knew they weren't going to hit him, but they were just buzzing him up and in. Just like letting them know, like you know, like I don't know. Just well, and that and that's the thing with that one too is I don't I don't weigh too much on the Machado one, especially because he was laughing and I think it was Nito was laughing as well at it. So I'm guessing it might have just been slightly errant from from Lugo at the time or, or I don't know because it was with two outs yeah. and it was a fresh count. I don't know. I just think they're buzzing them up a little yeah. bit just to let them know, back them off the plate. Yeah, but I mean, Kutch brings up a good point, right? Is you know, if you're having some sort of, I mean, in this case, red hot. Uh, it, right, it's not sticky. If anything, it's going to give you less grip in that sense. And I didn't really see him going like this all the time. No. No, it's interesting. I, I did chuckle uh, um, the shorts up there. Kim, his hat, uh, the brim of it was uh, definitely not brown. And uh, I was sitting there going, like, they're checking Musgrove's ears, and you see the bill of a hat that's fairly white. And obviously it's different, right, for a position player. I mean, usually now at this point, if there's a ground ball or a put out or something like that, the ball's tossed out of play anyway. So, um, yeah, it was just, just, a just weird, interesting stuff. Weird night at City Field for sure. Yeah. So uh, obviously now uh, the team they played the Padres, uh, they all move on, face the Dodgers in the NLDS. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit more on that here in a couple of minutes. Uh, before the Mets, obviously finish regular season officially here, and we can talk about this a little bit, right? 101 wins, 61 losses, second in the division. Um, still a lot to hang your hat on if you're a Mets fan, a Mets player within the organization this year as a whole. I, I consider this a still a, a positive year. Uh, certainly a lot of wins and a lot of check boxes you can go through on your short-term goals, even long-term goals. Uh, obviously the bigger picture, not where you fully wanted to be, uh, but I think this sets the table nicely for the next few years to come. Yeah, there's no way anyone, I don't care if you're a Mets fan or not, there's no way you thought this team was winning 101 games. Right. It's just to do that with any team in any season, that's just its very special. Not many teams can do that. So once we have a postseason play here, obviously, in a few weeks, we'll do our postseason wraps more closely on them, so make sure you keep tuned to that. But uh, with that, we'll turn our attention over to the Yankees. They officially know who they will have in the ALDS starting tomorrow. It's going to be the Cleveland Guardians. Um, defeated the Tampa Bay Rays 2-0, swept them in the wild card round. Uh, so we kind of know what to expect for the Yankees here. I know um, it's going to be interesting. I was not. I, I really wanted, preferred to face Tampa uh, if I were the Yankees. Uh, I know it's a really weird and strange thing to kind of put it as. But, um, you know, I just I think it got showcased pretty well in that Tampa series. Cleveland's pitching really is no joke. Uh, yeah, especially uh, Shane Bieber and Tristan McKenzie, back-to-back -back really, really good starts. Um, Bieber, I, he didn't ever pitch against the Yankees this year because um, the Yankees did go 5-1 and one against them. I know it's just regular season, but I also looked to see if Bieber pitched against the Yankees this year, and he, and he didn't. But McKenzie did and only allowed one run over seven innings. So that's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, for sure. I know um, Cleveland hasn't formally announced who they're throwing game one. We'll touch on that, obviously, in a few minutes. Uh, but there is some a lot of news and kind of uh, things to talk about here with the Yankees kind of going forward into tomorrow with uh, the formal announcement of the rosters. Uh, the biggest newsmaker ended up being <clears throat> not Matt Carpenter, who will 
touch on obviously here in a second. But for all this Chapman, uh, misses a workout, uh, ends up being a little bit more than a workout. He was slated to throw live batting practice, skipped it. Um, when asked why, the excuse given was not adequate enough. And Aaron Boone and Matt and uh, Brian Cashman have decided to just pretty much send him home to Miami, and he'll be off at minimum the LDS roster at this point. Yeah, I'm um, going into you know tomorrow, you know looking for the roster. I kind of didn't expect to see Chapman on there just because of his per performance lately. Um, but I didn't expect this. But with the way he's been throughout his career, I mean, he had the incident with his wife. He just doesn't seem like sometimes a very good person. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I wouldn't really surprise, like, be surprised. I'm not really surprised by this. Like, he probably knew he wasn't going to make the team, so he's like, <clears throat> ah, screw you guys. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. going to go. Why would I throw live batting practice to help my team when I'm not going to be on the roster? Right, and the tough spot here is I, I do want to play devil's advocate to this end. Um, they don't have a ton of lefty hitting, but one of Cleveland's red-hot hitters here, especially the second half of the year, has been Josh Naylor. Powerful lefty. I, I'm not saying I prefer more lefties better. Obviously, we have Ludke out there, right? And Wandy Peralta. And Wandy. And they're only going to carry probably 12 pitchers, so right. there's just no room for yeah. them. Yeah, but it, it's interesting. I, I kind of almost would have somewhat preferred, in a way, just an extra guy out there who's been in these – situations before where if you have to tighten up and be in a big spot at the end of the day Chapman still is close and I just I don't know if I necessarily trust Lucky or Peralta with that same mission if it came up obviously I do agree with you send him home I, I, I agree he didn't deserve probably a spot on the roster anyway I'm just trying to devil's advocate it a little bit because situations like, like that do pop up from time to time within game gameplay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just I, I just didn't see a spot for him. And, mm -hmm. I mean, more times than not, if you look at all the postseason appearances the Yankees have had since 2017, he's usually in the middle of it, and he's mm -hmm. usually the reason why the season officially ends. I mean, giving up the walk-off homer to Altuve, as we all know, just all these different moments. And I looked at the stat yesterday. Mm -hmm. Chapman has not had a save since May 17th. Wow. So, I mean, I just – I don't trust him in the big spots. I really don't. I'm, I've seen him over and over again, even in big regular season games. He just gets so rattled, he just walks batters. Right. And with a three-batter minimum, I mean, if you're in the middle of an inning in a postseason well, game. It's not necessarily three-batter minimum in that sense. Well, yeah. but more times than not, right. he's probably going to come in in a clean inning. Mm -hmm. I think it's even worse bringing Chapman in with a runner on base. I mean, the guy, I don't know, he just gets so rattled. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I'm glad he's not on the roster. Um, terrible move by him. Um, good thing he's a free agent. Definitely won't be back, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. So I guess the question is, uh, we can kind of play a little bit of the prediction aspect of it now, is who do you see being the main go-to de facto closer? Or, as we see a lot of times in the postseason, just the biggest spot seventh inning on. Um, we kind of see a little bit of like a, a committee aspect of it. Uh, but to me, I think the way that they used him the final couple of weeks obviously helped maybe having Holmes out, and that kind of alludes to where I'm going with this, I think they go Scott E. Frost. Yeah, Aaron Boone keeps uh, reiterating that it's going to be like a closer by committee. I think Jonathan Loisica is definitely up there with F. Ross, and I do think Holmes, if he's right when he comes back, um, if he's if he's right, if he's his old self, I do think he'll be in yeah. Um, yeah, a close situation probably. Mm -hmm. uh, another guy close to returning, slash the way it sounds, is returned, is Matt Carpenter. Uh, did take BP over the weekend during the workout sessions. Um, obviously has been rehabbing and coming back from the broken foot after fouling it off in the series out in Seattle back in the summer. Um, what are the prospects that we actually see him get meaningful stuff, though? Or if he's even actually going to be on the roster? Well, I mean, I, I was watching MLB Network the other day. I saw the ballpark came on Yankee Stadium, and it shocked me. He was working out at first base taking fly balls in the outfield. I thought all along Boone's kind of been hinting at, you know, that he'll kind of just be a pinch hitter and he won't, you know, play the field. But when I saw that, I'm like, wow, maybe he's progressing more than we thought, mm -hmm. and maybe he'll, uh, you know, play in the field. He was at first base. I know Rizzo is there, but, you know, you never know if he comes in late for something and pinch hit and they just move him there. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I, definitely tomorrow night I don't think he starts. 
I think he comes off the bench. I think DJ LeMay is somebody to watch too. I'm not sure if they're going to start him. Boone kind of sounds like he might be a bat off the bench, which is crazy to me. But I know he isn't himself. You can see it. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm interested to see, especially with the lineup, mm -hmm. for sure. I think um, what will be interesting here is, and this is where we can kind of probably start really getting, kind of getting in to the prediction of stuff of things on the roster. Obviously, you know, we mentioned a couple times, right, the roster is not due out uh, officially until 10 a.m. tomorrow, day of the game. But, you know, Oswaldo Cabrera certainly is, I'd say, cemented a spot on this postseason roster. Yeah, I definitely think um, he starts, too, tomorrow, for sure. Peraza, Oswald Peraza, the way his, you know, he got out of the gates a little bit rough. But at the end of the day, the final week of the year was red hot. Obviously, Carpenter comes back. Kind of, you know, maybe gives you a little bit more of leeway left-handed-wise, I guess, in a way. Um, it, I think a lot of this kind of depends on how you really want to do the lineups. Now, for Cleveland, not to go, obviously, in opposite direction here, what you can expect out of Cleveland is just pretty much, at least starting-wise, nothing but right-handed pitching. Um, Cal Quantrill, more than likely, will be starting tomorrow for them because they have to use them on Sunday. Yeah. After that, though, you could be looking at, you know, the guy you mentioned, obviously, with Shane Bieber, Kyle, Tristan McKenzie. I don't know really how he falls, but I, I'd expect him to be on the D Divisional Series roster. He was only off the wildcard roster because he pitched, I believe it was Saturday or Sunday of the final regular season, was Aaron Savali. Um, Zach Plesak is healthy. I don't know how he shakes in, but at the end of the day, folks, the Cleveland pretty much is nothing but righty starters. Here's the thing. I mean, I don't think they would, considering it's just the LDS. But would Bieber go on four days rest tomorrow? Do you think, or would they just no? Push I, him think, to I think I think they're going. I like, think they're going Cal Quantrill tomorrow for sure, and just push Every, Bieber to game two and yes. McKenzie for game three. Get that off day in there. Yep. Yeah, I think if it was like a do or die game, maybe they would. Uh, yeah, push a little him. bit different. A little bit different, yeah. right? But I think uh, because they were able to save Quantrill for from game three, I I. It, it, they haven't formally announced, but everything I've seen is pointing to Cal Control tomorrow. Um, and, and he's pretty I, solid at fire. Yeah, not right. he's not a big, big strikeout guy. Can get strikeouts, but he's a big uh, curveball, uh, not curveball, ground ball out guy. Um, if the name sounds familiar, Yankee fans, his father Paul did pitch for the Yankees for a season and a half in the mid two thousands. Uh, so uh, Cal is very good. Uh, this, like I said, the, the the Guardians pitching staff frightens the ever living hell out of me. It's a very good pitching staff. I don't think a lot of people kind of give them credit for. Uh, I think a lot of it gets shown on the offensive side, and justifiably so. The the team that they have on offense this year, obviously highlighted by Jose Ramirez, but you know guys like Andres Jimenez, Ahmed Rosario, um, our guy SpongeBob, Oscar Gonzalez. <laughs> uh, Obviously, his uh, rise through the ranks this year to get to the big league level has been pretty noted at this point. But uh, this is a this is a Cleveland team that certainly has pop in that lineup potentially, and obviously the pitching to to boot with it. Yeah, and these teams are very familiar. I mean, they've faced each other in the postseason. It seems like what two, three times in the last yeah. five, six years. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely have a little bit of a history, especially with that incident earlier this year. I remember with uh, Miles Straw with the fans yeah. and all that. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see like tomorrow night in that crowd, that environment, like yeah. how you know they act in the outfield and stuff like that. Like because people say that Yankee Stadium, like they don't want to come and play there because of the fans. Like are the fans going to really play a big impact in you know this series? So, it'll be interesting to see.